I was told before I came out this morning to speak very slow and very clear, very loud. Is this slow enough for you? All right. If I speed up, I need someone to stand up and scream hallelujah really loud at any point, okay? I've watched the kids sing that song all week, and it became a chore after a while, but it just, it's different when it's on Sunday morning. You kind of get a different feel, you know what I mean? So um, I want to first, before I say anything, say thank you to all the kids and big kids. I know y'all don't want to be called kids, but thank you for all of you all for coming this morning and for delivering this morning. Thank you all. All right, last week our, our VBS theme was shipwrecked, rescued by Jesus. And y'all got to understand, we were shipwrecked and stranded in here for five days. <sighs> but today's Sunday, and that was last week, so that means that we've been rescued, and that means Jesus Christ has indeed rescued me from VBS, right? <laughs> so we're going to pray. And we're going to get this thing rolling. Bow your heads and pray with me, please. Dear God, everything you've done in this program this morning from the start to this very point has been great and a relief, actually, I can admit. And I thank you for all those kids. I thank you for all those parents who allowed their kids to, to be here with us. And I thank you for those leaders and volunteers that helped me out last week and even this morning. Thank you, thank you, thank you for all the, those people. But from this moment on in this service, I, I need to take a step back and I need to let you do the, the talking through me, of course, so I need you to de decrease as much as Devante as possible and take this service whichever way it leads. Thank you for this morning. And we all said, Amen. When I think of the word shipwreck, I think of two things. I think there are two types of shipwrecks. The first type of shipwreck is the physical shipwreck. And this is probably the most common type of shipwreck because by definition, the word shipwrecks means the destruction of a ship by sinking or breaking caused by either storm or land. The destruction, key word, the destruction of a ship by sinking or by breaking caused by either storm, land, or kid, or kids. Let's sneak that in there. I know a lot of you all are too young to remember the Titanic. Uh, I remember the Titanic because I saw the movie. Um, the Titanic, to give you some perspective, the Titanic, this was around 1912. If you were alive, you can correct me or not. The Titanic was around 1912, and it was this huge ship. I mean, it was the biggest ship anyone had seen at the time. And to make you understand, many of you go on carnivals or Disney cruise lines on your fancy summer vacations. It was bigger than that. I mean, it was bigger than anything that ever happened. And everyone wanted to be there. Everyone wanted to be on that ship. Everyone wanted to watch this ship sail, because it was huge, right? And we all know how the story goes, right? We all seen the movie, Jack and Rose. We all seen it, we know the story. We know that the Titanic was traveling in the Atlantic Ocean, coming from Southampton up to New York City when there was an iceberg, a huge iceberg that was in the way of the ship and it was too late to turn left or right, so ultimately the Titanic crashed to this iceberg, which led to the lives lost of many, many people. But it was the physical, it was the physical component, the physical type of shipwreck that led to the Titanic destruction. Now this is another, another type of shipwreck, which a lot of people don't express enough, and the definition of the word shipwreck does not apply to the survivors. So the second type of shipwreck is the emotional shipwreck. And 
This was bothering me. The emotional shipwrecks usually happens right after a physical shipwreck already happens. Usually, think about the Titanic. After, after it had collided with this iceberg, many people, of course, died. Many people lost their loved ones. But right after the physical destruction, people were left three ways. They were left either lonely, a lot of their friends and family had died from the shipwreck. A lot of them were lost because they're in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. There's no land. There's no compass. It's freezing. They don't know where they are. And last but not least, they were all in desperate need of a savior. Can we agree to that? You don't have to agree. I'm going to say it anyway. So I'll share, a, I'll share an experience of an emotional and physical shipwreck that I've experienced once. I'll take you back a long, 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 long time ago. March 28, 2003, not that long ago, really. But I was around 10 years old, and I'll give you some perspective with this. I was 10 years old at the time, and when I was 10, even growing up as a kid, I had a very strong relationship with my grandmother. My grandmother, anything she told me to do, I'd do it. I mean, anything she said, I believed it, I answered because that was the respect I had for her, still have, even though she's not physically with me anymore. But I had a very strong connection with my grandmother, and on this particular night, March 28th, 2003, the news had called it a um, tornado storm. Now, I'm from Miami. That just means rain all night. So that's normal weather. But the news had amped it up, and it was really bad this day because it was really dark. It was really raining. It was lightning, thundering, and it was like floods and high winds. So my grandmother chose out of all nights to go to choose and make up her mind. She said, Mookie. All right, it's out the bag. My grandmother called me Mookie. She said, Mookie, I'm going to the store tonight. I'm going to Winn-Dixie, and I want to get some bananas, and I want to get some milk. So I'm like, out of all nights, Grammy, you want to go to the Winn-Dixie tonight? I said, why don't you just go tomorrow? You know, it'll be much better weather, much clearer. Don't worry about it today. You can go tomorrow. There's going to be bananas and milk tomorrow. She said, no. If anyone know, well, you guys don't know my grandmother. My grandmother is very stubborn, and I'll say that now because she's not in this room. She's very stubborn. And whatever she wanted to do, she was going to do it. So I tried to talk her out of it, you know. She said, no, I know what I want. I'm going to get my bananas, and I'm going to get my milk. So I said, fine. If I can't beat her, I'll join her, right? So I said, Grammy, well, it's raining outside. The lights are flickering on and out, off. I don't want to be home by myself. Can I come with you? I don't want you to be along in a storm like I can protect her, right? So I'm like, I don't want you to be along. I'll go with you. My grandmother said, sure, get your raincoat, get your shoes, and we're out. So we lived close enough so we could just walk to Winn-Dixie, bless you. And we walk to Winn-Dixie, we get the bananas, and we get the milk, and she's happy now. And walking home, we lived, like I said, we lived close enough where we can walk, and we were crossing this dirt road. A lot of cars would use it, but it wasn't really a street, it was kind of muddy and dirty, especially on this particular night with the rain. So we started to proceed to cross the street. And as we began to cross the street, that's when we were suddenly hit in a hit and run accident. The physical damage that were done, I don't remember because I suffered an immediate concussion, which means I blacked out, I was out for God knows how long. I didn't see anything, I didn't feel anything. But I do remember waking up and like anyone that's confused, I was, you know, I put my hand over my head and looking around to see where am I, I'm lost. The second thing I discovered is my hands were bloody, so I realized my head, I had a trauma to my head. So if I was to cut my hair right now, and I know a lot of you are pleased with the thought of me cutting my hair, but if I was to cut my hair right now, you would see those scars are still there from that day. So I see I'm bleeding from my head, my knuckles are ripped, my hands are bloody, and all I can remember being lost I don't know where I am at the time. I don't know what happened to me at the time. I was lonely because my grandmother, I knew I was with her, but I couldn't find her. I don't know where she was. And the third thing I knew for sure, I was in desperate, desperate need of a savior. Now, as scary as being shipwrecked sounds, as scary as it may seem, I'm not here. The focus of my sermon is not to tell you some sad story or to gain pity or anything like that. The focus of my sermon is actually to declare to you that being shipwrecked is a necessity. 
Meaning, our lives need to be shipwrecked from time to time. And I'll tell you why in two simple points. The first point is being shipwrecked is a necessity because we need to be saved. I see somebody rolling their eyes in the back. We all need to be saved, and I'll give you proof. What better proof than the word of God, right? Romans chapter 3, verse 23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came from Christ Jesus. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Based on that verse, I don't care if you're the oldest Christian in this building. In Clearwater, I know that's not very hard to find in here, right? I don't care if you're the oldest Christian in the world. I don't care if you're the priest of all priests. If Jesus Christ, are you listening? If Jesus Christ is not first in all that you are and all that you do, think, breathe, sleep, then my brother, my sister, my friends, you are lost and you are in desperate need of a savior. Some people are looking at me like I'm crazy when I said that. And I know many of us have been saved for 178 years, but a lot of times you, you don't know that you're lost until you've been found already. And for most of us, we don't know we need a savior until it's too late when we're already saved or worst, right? Think about our lives. Think about 2018. We've all become so desensitized to sin Meaning, we're all so used to seeing sin and so used to feeling and being in sin. So I'll give you an example. I can go on my phone right now and pull up whatever social media app I want and scroll, and I'll be used and numb. I'm speaking for myself, not for you all right now. I'll I'll be so numb to seeing mass shootings, kids killing kids in schools, terrorism, I'm numb to seeing it. I can keep strolling, and as bad and gruesome as they come, I'll see them, and it'll be just like another image in my head. We've all been sinning for so long that we forgot we were even sinning in the first place. And I don't know if that amazes you, but it amazes me that we can be living in a way so separated from God for so long that we don't think it's wrong anymore. It's completely normalized in our mind. As a result to us needing to be saved, The Bible says in Romans chapter 6, verse 23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. So, we live in sin. We sin every day. We're human. Romans 6, Romans 3, 23 said that we're all falling short and we all sin. We all fall short of the glory of God. So, the Bible tells us if we're not saved, then there's an end result. The end result is the wages, the result of our sins is going to lead to death. But the gift of God is eternal life. So that's why we need to be saved. My second point, the first point is on us. The second point is on God. The second point is God desires to save us. He likes to save us. He wants to save us. He's in the business of saving souls. I know we as salvationists, we wear our uniform. And we think we're the all-power, almighty saviors of the world. But God is in the business of saving souls. That's what, he, that's what he longs to do, right? I want everyone to recite together. And this is a little Sunday school quiz. I want everybody to recite together John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he... You guys learned that since you were a little lad, right? Everybody know that from the back of their hand. But don't stop there because John 3.17, the verse right after it, validates my second point. It says, before I read what it says, disclaimer, we all shipwreck and we all do some very bad things to one another and we also sin towards God. But he doesn't want to condemn us. He wants to save us which is why he desires to save us. So I'll tell you what John 3.17 says. For God did not send his son 
I think I said that a little fast. Was that too fast? All right. For God did not send his son to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. That's what we call, it's a song called The Good, Good Father. How many of you know that song? That's what we call The Good, Good Father. And I'm going to talk to the kids when I say this. How many parents of these VVS kids are here today? Raise your hand. I know we pointed you out earlier. Wow. All right. So kids, think about your parents. Kids, all right, don't look at your parents. Look at me now. You're going to see them later. Sometimes as kids, you all do things that disappoint mom, dad, or whoever, right? Sometimes you may not clean your room. Sometimes you may go to school and forget your homework. Sometimes you like to fight with your brothers and sisters. I've seen that here sometimes. And your parents sometimes, they, well, all the time, they are disappointed. And they may punish you, take things away from you, deprive you of things that you like. But they want nothing more than what's best for you. And they want nothing more for you not to do that same mistake again. Parents, is that true? I don't want to speak for you, but is that true? I heard hallelujah in the back. All right. That's just like God with us. Now I'm speaking to everybody because we're all children of God, right? We do things, we send towards each other, and ultimately we send towards God every day. And I don't know God, what he thinks, but I can imagine God is a little angry. Sometimes he's a little disappointed in us as Christians because he could be looking down and saying, well, you're supposed to be my people. You're supposed to be those Christians that are supposed to carry the light into the darkness not be the darkness. So sometimes he may be disappointed in us, but that never stopped him from wanting to save us time at the time at the time. He's done it for me. Maybe you guys have been saved and you're holy all your life, but God has saved me time at the time at the time when I know I've done things that need condemnation. So that's the second point. First point was God, no. The first point is that we need to be saved, and the second point is God desires to save us. So, I got a third point, and I know I said I only had two, but surprise, surprise. I got a third point, and this one's a little more personal, because I like to put myself on the on the back burner with stuff like this. The third point, I want you to think about, I said our lives need to be saved. God desires to save us, right? We all been taught that God is the biggest and the greatest and he's bigger than all of our shipwrecks and there's nothing we can stand against if God is for us. We've been told that all of, all of our lives, but sometimes we feel like God isn't saving us fast enough. Maybe that's just me. Maybe that's not you. But sometimes you are in those tough situations where you're like, man, God, I heard you was good. I heard you was going to deliver me from this but right now I'm not feeling you I'm not feeling you in my most dire needs I'm not feeling you saving me fast enough and I don't know everybody in here personally but I know there's some people in here that are struggling financially there's some people who are struggling with family issues we want to provide better resources for our children we want to make sure they go to the right schools grow up in the right neighborhoods we want them to eat at night and sometimes it's hard for us to do as humans we fall short of these things but I'll remind you something. One day, if anyone knows me in here, know I'll, I'll be getting married in less than three months to a beautiful young lady named Kayla Walker, soon to be Kayla Lawson. And, oh, but there you go. But anybody in here who's been married before know that the wedding process, planning a wedding can be really stressful. <laughs> All right, come on now. So we know that this is, and I've been praying for Kayla all my life. I've been praying that God gives me a woman that I can spend the rest of my life with. I've been praying that this would happen. But during this process, I'm like, man, yo, God, I'm beat up. I can't do it anymore emotionally, spiritually, financially. It's, it's draining, you know. And a lot of times we get haste. We, we, we react really fast. Instead of trusting God, we say, you know what? I, I can't do this anymore. I need, to, I need to call it quits. I'll tell you a story. One day, Kayla posted on Facebook. She said, Facebook is a social media 
um, outlet, guys. She said, um, this is the countdown to the wedding. I'm really, really stressed. And me being a jokester, I commented under her. I said, let's elope. Like, let's just, that was my way of saying, it was a joke, but it was a little truth behind it. That was my way of saying, God, since you, you granted me this woman and you said that everything is going to be okay, why is this so hard to do? So you know what, God? I said, forget the wedding. Forget the people. No offense. Forget the invites, the reception, DJ, all that. Forget all that stuff and let's just elope. I quit. I don't want it. I want you, but I don't want the process. And then right after I wrote that, Captain Everett Platt, she, she always catch me on social media. She, she commented under me and she said two simple words, two simple words that meant nothing that day. It meant nothing that day. But once BBS started and I started to read the Bible verses, and for anybody in here that's going through a shipwreck, I would share those two words. She said, keep still. That meant nothing to me. I said, I said, okay, under the comment, but I was like, this is stressful. You want me to keep still right now? I don't want this. And then I started reading the Bible verses. That keep still comes from Psalm 46, chapter 10. I think Allison read that. It says, be still and know that I am God. There are shipwrecks in here right now. I'm not a psychic, but it's called life. I know people in here are going through some crazy trials. That verse in John said, there will be trials, there will be sorrows. It's going to happen. God, there's no surprises in life. If you read the Bible, God will tell you, there's going to be some tough things that you might not be able to bear. And I'm not going to ask you all to tell me what's going on because I don't want to be overwhelmed with your shipwrecks on top of mine, right? But I do know a guy who you can tell that will make this thing so much easier. And I can't stand on the podium and say this anymore because I'm just a man, right? I'm, I'm not this, this guy who thinks he's above all. I'm just a man, and I'm a man with shipwrecks. Kids, you see me in my shipwrecks. These altars, and there's no pressure in this at all, but I'm going to finish talking because I've talked too much. And I'm going to get up one of these altars. And I'm going to ask somebody to come pray for me. And I'm going to invite everyone else to an altar and somebody else can pray for them. My mom used to sing this song. Every morning she would sing this song. It was, the words were, he may not come when you want him, but he'll be there right on time. He's an on-time God. Yes, he is. I didn't care about that as a kid. It meant nothing to me. But this week, <laughs> talk about being on time, I've been dreading this Sunday with anxiety in my stomach and that's no kidding praying for the kids I pray for y'all more than I pray for myself God honest truth praying for this core and praying for those that are struggling like me I can't call any of you all to fix my struggles and don't call me to fix yours but we can and call somebody else do y'all believe that? Do y'all seriously believe that? I'm going to challenge you to make your life easier. Right now it seems hard. It's hard. I know it's hard. Even the kids. Being a kid is hard, right? A lot of responsibilities. And adults, we have very big responsibilities. Sometimes our responsibility is those little people, right? There's plenty of space in this house. You can even kneel at your seat. You can pray with the person next to you. But leave it all. My coach used to tell me in sports, leave it all on the court. Don't come back to the huddle with any of that tension. So I'm going to tell you to leave it all at the altar. 
And don't dare go back to your seat with those burdens. There's some people still praying.
be scared to cry. It makes it all feel better. 